Good morning. My name is Will. Welcome to St. Basil's Anglican Church here in Artaman. Really glad that you can join us in person despite the weather, but also uh, if you're joining online, a big welcome to you as well. This week, we'll continue our sermon series from the book of Revelation. Pastor David will uh, continue to preach from uh, Revelation from chapter 6 to 8 as we look at the apocalyptic vision seen through the eyes of John. So in our service today, we'll sing a song together. There'll be a Bible reading. We'll hear a talk from Pastor David. We'll spend some time in congregational prayer, sing a song, say the Apostles' Creed together as believers, and we'll finish with some announcements. And as we start our time together, please meditate on the following words as I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for your promise of salvation to those who believe in your saving grace. And whatever storms we're facing in our lives, help us to be still and know that you are God. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the perfecter of our faith and the reason for our salvation. In his name we pray, amen. And uh, now Tuvan and Jen will come and lead us in song. Morning everyone. Psalm 103 verse one. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Let's stand and start service today by praising and worshiping our Lord with all our soul for his love, his kindness and his goodness. Let's stand and sing.
So now we uh, will continue with the Bible reading. This is from Revelation chapter 6 to chapter 8, verse 1. Um, please join me uh, on the screen as well if uh, you don't have a Bible. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the living, one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown. And he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make, the, to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hands. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades was following close by behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altars the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer, until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth. As figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind, the heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who can withstand it? After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea on, on any tree. Then I saw another angel hold, coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice, to the four angels who have been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. The great, uh, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. 
They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Thanks be to God. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Everybody, let me try. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to see everybody in church this cold, uh, wintry uh, morning. Um, just before I start, just quickly draw attention to uh, a book. Uh, it will be up for sale uh, at, at the entrance. Uh, it's called The Rohini Reflection. It's written by a previous bishop of Nor Northern Region, Dawn Cameron. Uh, it's writing really simple stories um, uh, about the parables of Jesus. Uh, really helpful devotions, helpful uh, thing through the devotions of Jesus. Uh, it is for sale up there at the desk uh, for five dollars when I want to come in. Um, let me pray as we look at God's Word together. Heavenly Father, as we look at your Word this morning, we just pray that you do help us, help us understand this part of the book of Revelation. Help us understand uh, what it means for us uh, as your plans are unveiled by the opening of the seals. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, one of the most famous paintings uh, by, by Pablo Picasso was a painting called Guanica. So that's a painting up. Uh, it was painted in 1937, depicting the horror of the Spanish Civil War. As you look at it, well, it was, it was a jumbled chaos of distorted body parts, contorted faces, and expression of agony. Even though it wasn't a sort of photographic image, like Picasso, as Picasso can do, he can express powerfully the horror, the terror, and the dreadfulness of war. Uh, apparently, there's a story in Nazi occupied Germany uh, in France. A German soldier gazed powerfully at his painting and apparently turned to Picasso and asked him, Did you create this? And Picasso's answer was quick. He said, no, you did. See, as we turn the pages of history, as you read in the newspaper, the reality of a world is not peace, but war. In the history pages, you read about the barbarity and the cruelty of the Assyrian army as they conquered the ancient world. Enemies were not just killed, but tortured. You read about the bloodthirst of the Mongol army as it swept through Central Asia and Europe. Whole cities were sacked, whole population were massacred, and the rest were taken into slavery. You read about the horrors of World War I and World War II. The many Jews in Europe were rounded up and sent to the gas chambers. In the East, the Japanese soldiers committed committed horrific atrocities against the population of Nanjing in China. Civilians were tortured, experimented upon, and killed. 
in the late 20th century, you read about genocide in Rwanda. That's neighbors turning against neighbors. Friends turning against friends. And the list just go on. See, as we turn the pages of the Bible, how do we make sense of the atrocities and the brutalities of history? For many non-Christians, they could not reconcile what they know of history and the belief in good and sovereign God. How can a good and sovereign God allow the horror of history to happen? For us as Christians, how do we understand all the wars and death? What is God's plan in our world? We have been studying a book of Revelation. In Revelation 4 and 5, John had a vision of heaven where he was ushered into the throne room of God. And there, God had a scroll on his hand. It was a peace plan in his purposes for his world. In chapter 6 and chapter 7, the scrolls were unsealed and God's plan was unraveled. As you read God's plan for this world, it was a plan for both judgment and redemption. As the Lamb opened the first four seals, the four horsemen of Apocalypse was summoned. The four horsemen alluded, um, um, were, were the four horsemen that rode around the world in the book of Zechariah, chapter 1. In Revelation 6, these four horsemen were the instrument of judgment on our fallen world. When the first seal was opened, the first horse was summoned. We're told he has a white horse and a rider held a bow. He was given a crown and he rode as a conqueror bent on conquest. Remember the color white was a color of victory and conquest. As you read the history of the world, well, it's a history of conquest, isn't it? For, from Alexander the Great to Julius Caesar to Attila the Hun to Genghis Khan, they all conquered cities and conquered empires they overtook countries and toppled empires. They were given power to rule and conquer by God. We should expect powerful tyrants to arise. We should expect conquering dictator will send. When the second seal was opened, he summoned a red horse. The rider had a large sword. He was given power to take peace from the earth and make people kill each other. Along with the conquerors, ban on conquest were wars and conflicts and hostilities. See, we have to understand that peace is not a norm in our world. Wars and hostilities, they are the norm. Jesus said we should not be surprised by wars or rumors of wars. In fact, it's part of God's judgment and God's plan for our sinful world. Yes, as Christians, we pray for peace. We want peace. But we should expect war. When the third seal was opened, well, the, 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 the black horse was summoned. The rider was told was holding a pair of scales. And a voice came from four living creatures, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. As often as happened with wars came famine. When I was growing up, well, World Vision was on TV trying to raise funds for the famine in Ethiopia. We witnessed Children with pot bellies as a result of malnutrition. 1.2 million people die. And one of the photos that captured the imagination of, of the world was a young child, thin to bone, about to die. And about a few meters away from the young child was a vulture, just waiting and waiting. So the famine of Ethiopia did not come from some lack of food or lack of agricultural land. It came from the constant conflict 
and civil war in Ethiopia. Often, famine followed war. When a fourth horse was summoned, it was a pale horse. We're told its name was Death. They were given power over the fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. And often with war and famine came disease and death. The color pale is the color of the corpse. We were told that after World War I, the Spanish flu killed double the number of people that died in the war. The bubonic plague, so, so-called a Black Death, came through the Mongol invasion of Europe. And at that time, it killed one in three of the population in Europe. See, the four famous four horses of the apocalypse revealed to us the judgment of God for our world. See, when we see war and famine and death, God has not con- lost control of this world. In fact, this was part of his plan. We should not be surprised. We should expect it. As the Lamb opened the fifth seal, the drama moved from the general judgment on this world to the specific persecution of the saints. John saw the souls of the saints who had been slain. They were under the altar, and the martyrdom was seen as a sacrifice on the altar to God. And they were persecuted, by told, because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They cried, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? How long? See, the persecution of Christians in our world is often ignored or covered up. However, throughout the history around the world, it's a norm. It's normal for Christians to be persecuted. Uh, there's a famous book called The Fox's Book of Martyrs. And that book well detailed the horrific persecution of Christians in the early years. In the milder cases, well, they were sidelined by the mainstream population. In extreme cases, well, they were imprisoned, they were thrown to lions and put to death by the sword. It was pages after pages of dreadful and horrific stories. Let me read out some, some of the stories for you. Symphorosa a widow and her seven sons, were commanded by the emperor to sacrifice to the heathen deities. She was carried to the temple of Hercules, scorched and hung up for some time by the hair of her head. Then being taken down, a large stone, stone was fastened around her neck and she was thrown into the river where she expired. With respect to her sons, they were fastened to seven posts and being drawn up by pulleys, their limbs were dislocated. These torches not affecting their resolution. They were martyred by stabbing, except Eugenius, the youngest, who was sawed asunder. Junarius, the eldest, was scorched and pressed to death with weights. Felix and, Felix and Philip, the, the two necks, had their brains dashed out with clubs. Sylvanus IV was murdered by being thrown from a precipice. The three younger sons, Alexander, Vitalis, and Marshall, were beheaded. The mother was beheaded with the same sword as the three latter. See, you read about pages and pages of horrific and brutal persecution. And the persecution was not just in the early Christian history, but during the Reformation, 
and all around the world. There's a website called The Voices of the Martyrs. And that website, well, details stories of horrific persecution that's happening today. In India, in Asia, in Africa, in the Middle East. See, sometimes we worry about our children will not go to a good school because of the commitment to Jesus. Or somehow our children will miss out on the opportunity in this world because we go to church. The reality is, well, it's usual for Christians to lose far more than that. This is the history of Christian throughout the ages and all around the world. In fact, God's word confirmed it. See, God's still waiting for the full number of Christians to be martyred just as they had been. See, the reason God's not coming down to judge this world and avenge the blood was because the quota of martyr has not been met. We could be waiting for you to be martyred. See, that's a real possibility for what it means to be a Christian. However, they were also given a white robe. Remember, the white is the color of victory and conquest. Yes, they look like losers in this world. But Jesus is telling them, well, they are the winners. You just need to have eyes to see. As the Lamb opened the sixth seal, we approach the final judgment of God. We read about this cosmic disruption. The sun turned black. The moon turned blood red. The stars fell like fig trees. The ancient worshipped the sun, the moon, and the stars because of their stability and their permanence. But now even these gods are being swept away. With the protection gone, gone who can stand? Today we worship the gods of money, don't we? Or education or housing, because they give us stability and security. We base our lives and our confidence on these gods. How just like the sun, the moon, and the stars, they too will be swept away one day, and they'll be useless on the day of judgment. Not only were the gods swept away, but they had to face the wrath of him who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. It was so terrifying that the rich, the kings, and the powerful were called on the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and to hide them. Being buried alive, I suspect, is one of the most ex worst experiences that anyone can endure. You know how you're stuck. You can't move. You've got a pocket of oxygen that quickly runs out and is slowly and agonizing suffocate to death. Friends, to all the kings and princes, that was preferable than facing the wrath of the land. That's how horrifying and terrifying it is. However, just as judgment was going forth to fall on the people of the earth, there was a pause, we're told. It was like one of the scenes in a movie where the action just freezes and a few people could move around and arrange the scene differently before the action unfreezes again. In 7, chapter 7, 1 to 4, the angels standing on the four corners of the earth held back the four winds of the earth. I suspect there's a four winds of judgment until God has put a seal on the foreheads of his servants. The seal is the seal of God's name, the seal of protection. In Ephesians 1.3, we were told we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit that deposit guaranteeing what's to come. 
on a Passover night, the lamb, the blood on a doorpost, men, the angel of death, will not come in. So here the Christians were being sealed by God. Furthermore, they were able, they were able to answer the question that we ask in the end of chapter Revelation, chapter 6, who can stand? For the great day of the wrath had come, who can withstand the judgment of God? Those who had been sealed by God, they were the ones who were standing. They were standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb. See, at the end of the world, the only thing that matters, not your degrees, your wealth, your qualification, your status, the only thing that matters is the seal of God's name. Because they are the other one, the only ones that were left standing. And here, John heard the number as 144,000. Again, like numbers, we are, is a symbolic in the book of Revelation. Just the number 12 represents the 12 tribes of Israel. The number 144 is 12 times 12. It represented a full people of God. Some have insisted only the Jews had been sealed. The problem with that is the tribe listed here, you notice they're not complete. The tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Dan are missing. So you can't really read this literally, literalistically. These are just symbolic numbers that represent the whole people of God. And verse 4 well, was what he heard, 144,000. But verse 9 was what he saw. What he saw was not 144,000. What he saw was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. See, 144,000 was just a symbolic number. And here when he looked, God's people were not just the Jews. God's people were not just an Anglo-Australian. God's people include people from every nation, tribe, and language. Every culture group is welcome. Every language is included. And you, whoever you are, well, you belong. At the same time, you realize that's a mission imperative for God's church, isn't it? God's church, in the end, is not just middle class, nor sure people of any particular culture. It's for all classes, all cultures, all languages. I'm really glad that we do have a Chinese service in our church where people can sing God's praises in Chinese. But it's imperative in our time that we reach other cultures like the Indians, the Japanese, the Eastern Euro 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 Europeans. See, God's church is for them as well. God's mission is for all people, all language, and all cultures. After the drama and the fireworks of the six seals, what do you expect when a lamb opened the seventh seal? Luke chapter 8, verse 1. When you open the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. This is not what you expect, is it? However, to hear the silence is as dramatic as the noise and the activities in the previous six seals. It was as if God's judgment was finally revealed. The whole cosmos was completely awestruck. All creatures have nothing to say. say there are no more excuses. Everybody was silent. It was so terrifying. It was so horrifying. But it is also so right. Friends, if you're not sealed with the mark of the Lamb, there's really no hope. No future for you. This is it. God will be silent. What some points we can take from Revelation 5 and 6? 
just quickly to three points. Next slide. Friends, do not be surprised by the carnage and death in our world. It's part of God's plan for the judgment of this world. When a COVID pandemic swept around the world last few years, many people were surprised. Yes, it caused lockdown. Yes, it caused death. Yes, it caused devastation in the world economy. But it's very much part of God's plan for our world. We live in a fallen world. We should not expect peace. We should expect war. Secondly, do not be surprised when Christians are persecuted. In fact, this is part of God's plan for you, for Christians. See, in our hearts, in my heart, many of us believe or want to believe what we call the prosperity gospel. We want to think, isn't it, if I'm a good Christian, if I go to church and give to the offertory, God will bless me and my family. And when things do not go well according to plan, we fall into some sort of existential crisis. The opposite is true. Being Christians, we should expect to be sidelined and excluded by the world. Being Christians, we should expect not to get what we deserve. Being Christians, we should expect sometimes even to be hurt and to be martyred and killed. That is God's plan for you. We're still waiting for the full number of martyrs before God's judgment ends. Daily we know, know that whatever security we have in this world in the end will fail us. Whatever security you have might be education, career, wealth, prosperity. Remember the sun and the moon and stars was a symbol of permanence and stability. The, sun's been going around, uh, uh, the earth has been going around the sun for ye- years and years and years. You look up at the, star, the sky, that's where's the moon and the stars. However, in the full judgment of God, well, they will all be swept away. And it will be so horrifying to call on the rocks and the mountains to fall on you and bury you alive. And the only protection on that day that anyone can have are those who are sealed by God himself. Are you sealed by God? Will you be able to stand on that day? Or like the rest, you'll be swept away, terrified by the one who sits on the throne. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at this part of our world, remember again of your plans for our world. We know your judgment that's fall, fall on the fallen world of wars, and famine and death. And for us Christians, the plans for us, it's not success, but persecution, martyrdom, and death as well. Help us, Father. Look to you as our source of security. Help us look to Jesus as our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mel will now lead us in congregational prayer, followed by um, Tuvan and Jen, who would uh, continue to lead us in song. Uh, We're going to pray today uh, for what we heard, as well as for the rain, um, for the pledge that happened the last few weeks, and for the upcoming youth camp. Let's pray. 
Our Father in heaven, you are the creator and sustainer of this world. By your design, you have created people to live under your rule, caring for and in harmony with the world and everything in it. Yet because of our sinfulness, we have subverted this world order. We have ignored and disobeyed you and we have turned away from you. And in doing so, we have caused the brokenness in this world. Father, we are sorry. We deserve this judgment of yours. Please forgive us. We give thanks that in your mercy, you have given us a way back to you through your son, Christ Jesus, who saved and redeemed us by his blood, washing us clean and giving us a place in your heavenly kingdom as your children. In these last days, let us not be distracted by the temptations and distractions of this world, which are here today, but gone tomorrow. Instead, help us be fixed on you and your promise of heaven, where there really is safety and security, in order that on the last day, we can stand there with Christ Jesus in heaven. Father, today we ask for your hand over the current rain that is creating flood concerns across many parts of New South Wales. Please bring help to these communities and if needs be, enable the people there to evacuate safely and find good shelters. We ask that you also keep others safe from those who are traveling on the road to those living in unsafe conditions. Please protect and preserve lives for we know you are a merciful and loving God. As we continue to pray, we want to give thanks for the works of this church. Thank you for the faithful service of so many you have put here, whose work helped to teach, encourage, and serve each of us each week. We particularly want to praise the children and youth ministry team who gives their time to care for the creche and youths each Sunday. We know how crucial it is that these children should grow up knowing you and having a personal relationship with you. So we ask for your hand as we consider whether to hire a kids or youth worker for our church. Please give our parish council wisdom as they look at the financials of our church, taking in the pledges given in these last weeks. Lastly, we pray for the upcoming youth camp happening in the school holidays. We are so excited that about 20 youths have already registered. As they look forward to a weekend of fun and games, we ask you to prepare their minds to learn. May they walk away learning what life is really about and how Jesus is really the key to knowing life and knowing your plans for them. And please keep everyone who are going safe and well, particularly we ask you to strengthen the leaders and give them good rest in the week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So unlike the kings and the princes of this earth, how great it is to be reminded that our true security and shelter is in our God a rock of ages. So let's stand and sing the last song.
Millions of Christians all around the world and through our all ages, but all united in our faith have recited the Apostles' Creed. It is a good reminder of the gospel that we believe in. Please join with me in saying the Apostles' Creed together. The words are up there. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Um, just a quick uh, few announcements. Um, so we've got the regular Bible study groups. Some of them might be having a bit of a break during the school t uh, holidays. But if you're interested in joining, yeah, you're welcome to contact um, Pastor David. And there are a few sessions running throughout, like Tuesdays, Wednesday, Thursday, and even Sundays. And uh, the kids' church are continuing. Um, yeah, it starts at 9.50 and finishes at 11.15. Um, yeah, this afternoon, we do have youth group at 3 p.m. If people or youths are interested in joining, please contact uh, either Jack or Peter. Uh, yeah, we heard earlier the prayer for the youth group camp. So if there are still more youth who are interested in going, I believe that it's still not too late, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Uh, and this evening, Pastor Dave will actually be at the evening service as well, giving a talk on the parable of the rich fool from Luke chapter 12. Now, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, at the back, there is this book. Um, that you can purchase for five dollars. It is, um, you know, Rohini Reflections, but there are quick devotions, uh, short stories, the parables as well are being uh, sort of explained. Um, I think it'll be quite useful for your daily kind of reflections as well because they're quick read and each of those chapters are quite small, uh, two, chap two pages, so it won't take too long. So if you are interested, um, Bob will be behind um, sort of um, you know, talking to you if you're interested in buying one. So it's only five dollars. Well, we've seen from Revelation chapter 6 to 8, and despite how some of the imageries are quite graphic, quite confronting, but there is one image that I want to draw you. So if I could read from Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. There before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb they were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb this is a comforting image for me because it is showing that we are all together at, on that day so I thought I'll leave you with that image and close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior, who is our hope and our peace. Give us all a renewed faith to love you and serve you as we leave today's service. Help us to be still despite a storm raging around us, both physically and perhaps in our lives but Lord we know that you are truly beside us always and in your name we pray amen um, just a few uh, housekeeping um, if you could you know use some of the wipes and wipe down the areas that you have set in uh, there are bins that you can dispose of them on the way out thank you and I hope to see you all next week bye bye